that to me was something that was instilled in me by the labels. You know, I, I could not enjoy these because they were flops. When Clapton called me, he had received a copy of my album from my manager and uh, he just he fell in love with it. He was on tour in Japan, but he called me and said, Jelly Cream is my favorite album in the last five years and I love the songs, I love you as an artist. And you know, that's sort of, that's where our friendship began and um, it was just interesting because that lifted me that I had one of the most valid artists of all time saying this is a great piece of work. Just, it gave me a lift and I think from that point on my self-esteem as an artist has been uh, a lot better. You know, I'm really strong now. I was astonished that anyone uh, uh, in this day and age was was playing that way and it's like oh well thank god you know someone some young guy is playing like that And apart from that, there was the, the, the singing and the writing. So I wanted to meet him as soon as possible. And when I came to, to L.A. to do the B.B. King album, I, w I asked him if he would like to collaborate on just play on the floor. And, and we'd work out how to do it as we went along, you know. And I just wanted to meet him. And he's the real thing, you know. I mean, the first thing I, I noticed physically was he had Lightning Hopkins tattooed on his arm. And I mean, that's a serious commitment for a start you know and uh, and I just had tremendous respect for him from the from the word go and and he can play he's a real player you know and they're, and they're only a handful blues players the the really the real thing I think in the early 70s Doyle would have been a monster superstar and it's not even to say that his music now sounds retro it's just that it's not you can't put it into one specific slot. I wanted to tell him when he first started playing with me that I thought he ought to know that I'd never heard anyone like him too. It's like it, you know, at some point Stevie Ray stopped sounding like Albert King and sounded like Stevie Ray and, and Doyle is the same. Nobody sounds like, he plays like nobody else and yet it belongs in the genre, you know what I mean? It belongs in the genre and yet it stands on its own. I mean you can study all your life and and still only know it intellectually, but he knows it from inside somehow. When people like Roger Waters and people like Eric Clapton bless this guy as the heir apparent, it, do I feel vindicated? Absolutely. Does it make me feel any better? No way. Because then it just makes me realize I was, we were, we sh if, if we would have stuck that much longer, who knows what could have happened. Thank you, Eric. Trouble of this world, Lord, how soon we'll be done with the trouble of this world. I'm going home to live with God.
the people who were signing artists and running record labels in the in previous eras had the respect of artists. They could talk to artists about the nuts and bolts of music. They were often musicians themselves. They often understood the dynamic of how to make music that moves people. And those people were the, the, the John Hammonds of the world, say. Those people were very important to the development of these artists. And they understood that it takes time. It's not overnight. And they were willing to sort of very gently push instead of uh, do, you know, instead of shit bark marching orders, which is what these people do now. The great John Hammond had Aretha Franklin and made so-so records with her. Tried to make her a jazz singer. Tried to um, let her handle standards. Wexler heard the part of Aretha Franklin that would be not just commercial, but would be great. And he did that by honing her for the radio. He did that by, by not trying to slot her into an old formula, but by realizing that, that she could do something new that, that would still jump out of the radio. But you don't look for great artists when you're an A&R guy. Your primary goal is to keep yourself from getting fired. And the primary way to do that is to only take the calls from the prominent lawyers and you know other managers who you know are going to be able to leverage some other big act that they represent against you if you don't respond to a new act that they're shopping. There became a fear element in the record business where everybody was so concerned about surviving that everybody had different agendas. You know, you put 20 people in a boat, but everybody wanted a paddle. I mean, the whole idea of A&R, artist and repertoire, that's what it means. In the 40s, Frank Sinatra said, I want to do records. So these guys would run around and meet songwriters. And they'd get songs, and they like the songs, they bring them to Frank, say, Frank, do you like it? Frank would say, yeah or no. If he didn't like them, they ran out and get more songs. That's what an A&R guy did now. Now you have these people sitting around, standing in judgment of talent. If they had the talent, they'd be singing or writing or playing. So, I mean, Stevie Wonder didn't need an A&R guy. Stevie Wonder said, here's my record. Thank you, Stevie. I mean, that, that was it. Prince, here's my record. That's A&R, man. You just, you know, answer the phone, take the credit. You know, I'm not, I'm not against that. But the idea that there's some person in the middle who stands around real musician and is like the great dividing line between success or failure is just a joke. That's a total joke. That is one of the most useless jobs in the universe right now. Virtually all of the important music that, that lasts, that lingers, that sells those 10 million copies of albums is not formula music, it's crazy music. It's the Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon. It's the Beatles, it's Led Zeppelin, it's stuff that was out there. Like I, I was talking to one writer who said, well man, I, I don't really hear anything new anymore. And I said, well, man, given the fact that Ornette Coleman was new and everybody hated it for five years, and Coltrane's song came out and everybody hated it for five years, what you're saying is that, like, unlike all the other writers, if it was really new, you'd know it was new when you heard it, and you'd love it. That's a hell of an assumption. The quest for the instant hit means a quest for formula, and formula is short-lived. Someone like Dave Matthews, I think, became... He probably changed the business more than Napster in a lot of ways. He changed the business model forever. If you had asked people to listen to 30 Seconds of Dave Matthews, they probably would have said, oh, this is lame. I haven't heard anything like this before. This is, you know, there's a violin in the band. Oh, what the hell is this, you know? It's garbage. You had a lot of people saying, this is not radio music. It's not going to do well. We don't test very well in markets, uh, radio markets, but then eventually they get on because people, after listening to the record for six months, call the radio and say, would you, would you play that song again? I think one of the shortcomings in any kind of uh, uh, corporate, the, co the standard corporate model is the bottom line becomes money. And then that, that I think, it, 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 may be, it may be successful for a while, but I think it's dehumanizing. And I think it inevitably fails because it sort of eats itself. Yeah. 